Well, thank you, the pan uh, well, let me welcome you to the panel, uh, which is once again truly a global panel who's going to give you perspectives that are very unique because at this stage of a blockchain, at this stage of the in industry, the current uh, environmental issues relating to cryptocurrencies are all reflected in the communities which these gentlemen represent and they're all quite different right now in terms of regulatory environments and national approaches. So what I want to do just if you could for two minutes because I'm incapable of two minutes okay so it's, it's sort of hypocrisy but you know sorry okay. Dr. Kamalaf, if we could start with you, just with a, you know, one-minute um, introduction, because why should I do that for you, right? Go. The digitalization and the introduction of blockchain is followed. It, it, the, all stories have two sides: the bright side and the risks. Let's call it this way. Uh, we know the story of success, economic success, uh, high margins uh, in, in these quasi-financial markets related to cryptocurrencies. But on the other side, we, we see the inequality, for instance. Yesterday we were talking about inequalities. A huge problem. Uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner, got his Nobel Prize for studies of inequality, uh, something that we've never seen before. Thomas Piketty, the capital in the 21st century, he writes about that. Uh, uh, it demands uh, to, somebody should maintain the broader picture, the complete picture of what's going on, all the consequences of introduction of blockchain into societies and into economies. And again, I insist that in the focus, in, in the epicenter of all these processes should be the interests of each and single particular citizen. So that's my point and that's uh, the mission uh, that I'm following in this field. Thank you. Sir? The introduction of yourself a bit. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Hong Chin No. I'm represented for Korea for Propy Station in San Francisco. 안녕하세요. 제 이름은 노홍균입니다. Uh, uh, shall I introduce our company or shall I? Yeah. Uh, our company is a cross-border real estate uh, transaction platform based on the Ethereum network and our proprietary solutions. And we're, I really totally agree what Dr. Kamenov said about inequality is the blockchain, and as such, uh, Mr. Doran said in the keynote speech about breaking down walls, the blockchain is all about opening walls, breaking down the barrier, and opening the real estate market itself for those who didn't have the opportunity, who didn't know they could access the market itself. Like you said, it's a 217 trillion US dollar global market. And what we're trying to do is break down the wall for those people who didn't know, didn't have the property rights, didn't know how to utilize the property rights. Thank you. Very good. Mike? Hey, everyone. My name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the CEO of Real Estate Chain. We're based out of Boston, and it's great to be here. Uh, real Estate Chain is focused on the information layer of real estate. So things like photo sets, floor plans, property data, parcel data, demographics, and uh, all the information that goes into it, and building reliable global bridges uh, at that layer. Um, we're focused on new development properties uh, to initially build a new international standard and a big database for real estate related data globally. Uh, like these guys are saying, uh, there's a lot of walls to be broken down, and we need to do it together. So there's a lot of different projects in the real estate space, all blockchain related, with the aim of decentralization and adding 
value to the people who, are, who participate in proportion to how much they contribute to different types of networks, whether that's monetary or doing work or adding value in different ways. So there's many projects in the space and we all need to work together. We're focused on the information and people layer and connecting people properly uh, to validated truthful information. Others are working on problems related to titles and deeds. Uh, there's P2P projects with to home sharing, uh, like BTOKEN or time sharing, like Crowd Villa. Many different projects that are going to be able to interlock in the future to create a, a common uh, vision of a, a better system of real estate that uh, works together. Thank you, Mike. Constantly, we, no, we already heard from you. No, go ahead, please. I'm just, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I want to say I graduated uh, Moscow Technology uh, University uh, in red electronics. And for many years I am in real estate. Now I am uh, president of uh, Moscow uh, Real Estate Agency uh, Association. And I know uh, this business for both uh, sides, from uh, uh, digital side and from real uh, a real situation in our uh, real estate in the over the world. So uh, I, I, I I'm trying to be on on the uh, first uh, position in comprehension of all processes what uh, we have now in our business. So uh, uh, you you heard about uh, what we are doing now, and so uh, etc. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Hi. First of all, I'm very excited to be here. <clears throat> Although um, I'm Bulgarian myself, um, I live almost 20 years in Dubai. Uh, same as Mr. Dorian, working at the oldest industry, uh, real estate. Second, never mind. <laughs> we'll keep that for later. Um, and um, thanks to this. Incredible people. The technology already exists. Um, however, uh, I come from a place in the world where uh, usually technology is adopted in a very late stage. Uh, so the purpose of me coming to Korea is really to um, see the implementation of technology firsthand and try and take the most of it with me um, uh, in the place where I live. So within 20 years, um, the city of Dubai has dramatically changed uh, because of the real estate industry. Um, some people say that at one point of time, 50% uh, of the world cranes were concentrated in, in, in all the construction that takes place in Dubai. Um, looking at such a giant uh, scale of, of projects taking place, I wouldn't find a better place to implement technologies like this uh, and, and make it uh, more efficient, cheaper, um, and create a bigger success. That's great. Now let's go to the realities. Um, oh. It's Hong, right? Yes. Uh, right. Because it's Hong and Mo. It's <laughs> uh, first name is Hong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, you can call me Hong. No, no, it's. it's <laughs> uh, I didn't know if you did it like the Western style or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> well, both ways well. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is there right now an example of an operating successful real estate platform? Uh, actually, I have to say yes, and it's not to just pitch our company. Our company probably has already built a title registry system. It's a unified title registry system that can be used uh, for every county, states, or countries all over the world as long as those governments accept those as a back end. Let me rephrase note. that question. Yeah. I know the ideas and infrastructure are probably in place, but is there an operating company, is there an operating system today that's being widely utilized, that's incorporated the concepts of crypto mm -hmm. into its platform and is actually up Working. and running and has a, at least a certain scale of operation where we can say it's 
late startup post post startup? That could be a uh, tough question. It's a good question, but yes, partially we had deals with Ukraine and the state of Vermont at the count of South Burlington. And also we're talking with California, Atlanta. But if you're talking about widespread uh, adoption of the platform itself, I think it's just in their infancy as the economy in whole. So Mike, if we really want to talk about the state of the blockchain application to the real estate uh, world. In your opinion, is there one I can go to tomorrow, access and utilize because I have, I don't know, I have Shippo and I want to put, you know, I want to put a million dollars into something in China operating from LA other than the traditional real estate, sir. I mean, I'm talking one. One is truly working within the blockchain universe with the convergence of crypto, proving the case of efficiencies. I'd say no, we're not, we're not there yet, Pietro, but uh, we're getting there. There's uh, limitations in technology uh, that are being innovated on with scale and things like gas on Ethereum, and then uh, Within, on the transaction layer, so there's many people working on uh, this part of, of the puzzle. So things like tokenizing housing assets or REIT type structures or ways to uh, pay or invest in, uh, in, in uh, different types of properties. And there's a lot of companies working on this and they're dealing with regulations specific to the area. And um, they're, you know, it's a, it's a process. And uh, I think we're, we're moving on getting there and being able to integrate with many of these who are successful in, in their spaces, but it's, we're not there yet. Okay. So in your opinion, um, where in term, and when we use the internet as the comparative in terms of blockchain applications, are we, Bezos in his garage selling books? Have we moved beyond that? Are we the Google guys thinking this through? Are we Zuckerberg still in his bedroom in his family house where his idea of privacy is do not enter on the sign on his door? I think we're closer to uh, Bezos in his garage and, and Zuckerberg, <laughs> 93, 94 of the internet type era. and. Uh, you know, it's a lot to be worked out, but incredible opportunity on the other side of things. Well, I think that's the opportunity, isn't it? Because we have the example of internet. We have those as our, uh, our case studies for how it gets done. And there's now precedent for how capital finds startups because Facebook in 2008 was a startup that nobody knew about and Google that didn't see it, and this is what I liked about Draper's comments. There's always that new opportunity. There's always that next billion dollar company. And right now, there's like, a, I think personally, there's like a five year window where you can consolidate, if you can get yourself launched, any of you, because it all, Korea's just, there's one thing I love about Korea, you are, there's no fear of technology in this place <laughs> at all. I mean, I think in Korea is the only place in the world somebody feels sorry for you when you show them your phone and it's six months old. And they're wondering why aren't you more successful <laughs> or more up to date, all right? But I think, wouldn't you agree, Chris, that that very fact that what took 20 years on the internet to get to is going to take less than 10 and the applications of blockchain. I totally agree. And just to reflect to what Mike said, um, in terms of uh, where we are, where we're standing, and this is the most important message to the audience most probably. If you take technology as a startup itself, uh, within the information era, just mind that we are no longer in that information era. That technology already exists. And only the way this technology is applied in the today's era, which is now the acceleration era, will make a difference to you. Um, five years, 
I think you should cut this in half with this type of uh, people. Yeah, totally. Um, because I cannot see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really important to understand is that uh, the technology already exists, and, and it's just how it's connected and how it's being utilized and the application will make the difference. Now, let me ask another question. Um, Dr. Kamal, do you see... Now, I, I almost always hear crypto mentioned in the same space as blockchain. And I once watched a panel of five or six companies that were pitching their, their ideas. And there was four of them when the question was asked, what do you think is the future of blockchain? And they waxed very philosophical about how wonderful it was all going to be and decentralized and whatnot. And then they asked one other guy who said, I don't know anything about blockchain. I, I, I exchange, I, you know, I trade crypto. <laughs> <laughs> What's in that statement when, when, what do you think is in that statement, inherent in that sta statement, Mike? Or I asked Dr. Kamala, what do you think is inherent in that statement? That disassociation, or is it a convergence that is soon to be inseparable? I think this statement reflects the need of the common denominator in understanding of what's going on. And uh, uh, that is why th this, this common comprehension, these discussion platforms uh, are very highly demanded at this moment so that everybody would understand where, where it all leads us. Uh, because with the experience uh, that's what Dr. Edward Deming, the creator of PDSA cycle, uh, once said, the experience exists only when it, is, it can be theoreticized and educated to future generations. Uh, we see a lot of examples of startup companies very successful, but if it cannot be scaled up, it, we can call it a contextual success. Or just, it happened. But what about systematic improvement? Uh, I, I think the dialogue lacks this approach for the time being. So the common approach, the discussion where, uh, it's like the, the International Communication unit, uh, Union uh, exists in the, uh, as, as the organization of the United Nations uh, that regulates how the communication channels joined between, on, on the borders of the countries, that the internet is going to, from one country to another. There should be the same policy discussed uh, to exchange the information within the block, global blockchain uh, uh, scheme because it will be the concern of each government who holds the information. We have Facebook in the United States. We don't have Facebook in China. We have just two million accounts of Facebook in Russia. We have our own uh, Russian system of uh, Kontakte, which has 60 million accounts. And that will be the, uh, the challenge, the major challenge. So the education is a uh, number one thing. OK, well, let, let me. Could you raise hands, Cause, and I won't see you, but now I'll see you. Okay. I'm going to put the hat on here. How many of you out there creating your own applications are talking about having your own coin? How many? You can raise your hand. We're not going to, like, have the KCIA investigate you. So none of you are looking at creating platforms that are going to be tokenized. Is that right? So you're all just doing this for, human, for humanity's sake. I'm going to guess almost all of you are looking to do this. <laughs> and you, you just don't want to be the guy who raises his hand. OK. All of these currencies. Now, you're going to ask, you're going to have Vermont working and accessing your platforms. And are you going to ask? Are they going to be doing that through some sort of token-based access where they get rewards or they get something where, 
where they, you know, by using you or the number of clients that then access that system will become part of that ecosystem. Is that what you're thinking? Huh? Uh, for the pilot at Vermont, it was, as a pilot, it was basically to prove the theory itself that through using the Ethereum blockchain transaction ID to prove it as a legal proof that the transaction actually happened. And as for the Vermont, as for Var Vermont, they were, they were very advocative of the blockchain technology and outgoing. So I have to say, agreeing on Dr. Kamala's point of education and make, making the system itself, and it was to make a point that the Ethereum network can be capable with working the government entities to prove of the transaction. In going through that payment gate, are you tokenizing your, yeah, is yours based, that transaction base, is that on your own token? The transaction itself can be made through fiat or Bitcoin or Ethereum, and our own coin is called Pro, P-R-O. It's used as a fee, listing fee or a service fee, and it's used to activate, to uh, enter our own blockchain called the Title Deed Registry blockchain. Okay. Mike, same with you, right? And you've got like two of them. Yeah. So we have uh, an ERC-20 token built on top of Ethereum. Uh, the primary purpose is uh, permissions. So transferring and giving people access to permissions of information. So if someone owns a photo set or floor plans because they're the uploader, the homeowner, and allowing that to, that to be uh, transferred. And then the other is kind of a representation of the information itself. So actually the photos and floor plans and um, making that into an object that can be transferred on the blockchain. And that's what we call a non-fungible token. So it's an ERC-721. And that's, those aren't oh, traded. Oh, one of those. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. <laughs> I have no Sorry. idea what you just said. <laughs> no, the real important, the, the point I'm trying to get here, and, and it's interesting, Constantine, your, your entire platform, which is all about maximizing in terms of a truly scaled urban development, very focused. I mean, these things take 10 years, and the values are $20 billion. I know, we did one. It's like you really don't have to go far from home after that because that pretty much absorbs you for like most of your life, of which you could import technologies like yours, Pong, like yours, Mike, into this to make that whole process run far more efficiently. But you never once mentioned anything to relates to any sort of a tokenized base. Is part of your system? Do you have any anticipation of that? Can it be actually done in Russia? Uh, the main, the main thing uh, is uh, we have assets. Yes, real estate uh, has assets, and so uh, we can uh, issue tokens. Yes, that. Uh, when uh, we use uh, real square meters, when we use uh, real uh, equity, we can uh, use uh, our own uh, tokens uh, and like, uh, 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 like currency, yes? You can, uh, you can see this process uh, when you uh, start uh, in developing some money, uh, after the uh, growth of the building, you can see the growth uh, of uh, your uh, token. Your token, right. Yes. So you do have that, con it's not there, it's not mentioned. No, it, uh, we can do it, we can do it. So it's a concept, yes. all right. Yes. So what you're going to do is reach out to one of these folks out here who are working on some technology and say, can you come to Moscow? Uh, we like what you're doing. Uh, in fact, we might even invest in you if your technologies can prove to work out. Because Absolutely. we're talking in, in the mobilization of capital for one of these smart cities, it's always in the range of total value created, somewhere around $20 billion. 
Okay. Absolutely. And, you know, you got two or three of these, and you're talking, you know, a hundred billion dollars in economic activity between five very localized and, and and focused locations. I mean, that's a huge business. When you're starting from grassroots and being able to install and those applications from, and it becomes part of its DNA and gets more efficient as time goes on and through user. And these things go from zero populations to half a million, which Korea has done with Pundang and Ilsang, and they've proven the case that you create, echo, you create user communities built within bounded ecosystems who happen to be the user communities and all that are operating within that that boundary of that new city, because it also bleeds out, because economies bleed out as they require deliveries into the city, they, they need services into that city that didn't exist before. You need to build subways, you need to do, you can what, now what? Perhaps start looking at new ways of funding those infrastructure through cryptocurrencies and tokenizations, because there's movement back and forth and a dime spent every single time. That's millions of transactions within one node. Hmm? Pietro, can, can How about, well, well, let, me, let me go to Chris for just one second. Now, Dubai is way ahead of the entire world, but small places can be, because you can experiment faster and put things into application quicker, and you don't have so many levels of government to go through to create that. Now, Dubai, I, I don't know if anybody out here is knows this, but by 220, they intend for every real estate transaction, every, every investment, every capital move, everything is going to be on the blockchain. It will be the world's laboratory for blockchain application on a nationwide, even as small as it might be, it's, it's a nation, right? The Emirates are. Any, is that Emirates or just Dubai? Well, the Emirates, they're never apart uh, because they're all governed by the same um, force. Right. Uh, blockchain really is the medium, but when, when we were talking now about cryptocurrency, I, I just would like to um, emphasize on something. Um, Terry, in the beginning, when the Skype conversation was going, mentioned a number. You now mention another number. I really don't know what that number is. All I know is that at this point of time, we have a huge number, a huge value created through the cryptocurrencies. And uh, I can only imagine uh, uh, what that value will expand to when more people like Sergey and uh, Konstantin add cryptocurrency to an existing asset, to something that already exists. I know that for many people that are still skeptical about entering the crypto market, uh, uh, because there is no um, cover, because there is no substance, because there is very little commodity at this point traded with cryptocurrencies. But imagine what's going to happen to cryptocurrencies once they actually are linked or um, responsible for projects like uh, the real estate pro project that cost uh, develops. It will be enormous. It will be giant. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, I watched a video on YouTube, uh, which basically was setting up a crypto account, a wallet. And so setting up a crypto, a wallet for cryptocurrency uh, for dummies. Okay, so naturally that was where I went to first. Because I wanted to see what the average person who's thinking about crypto I mean, really, the average person, we're expecting to use these systems. And the first thing, this very smart young lady who's a crypto expert tells you is, get a notebook and write down your password in the notebook, <laughs> okay? All of these computers around the world, all of this technology all over the place, Get a notebook and write all your passwords down in three notebooks and put one in a bank. You know, send the other one to your priest, <laughs> all, right? all right? And keep the other one around so that nobody can see it. Okay. 
And then it took about a half an hour of education of how you set up the protocols and everything else, all right? And I'm just thinking to myself, okay, multiply people doing that. Up to now, it's people are pretty savvy. They want to try it. They go and do it. Now, we want to normalize this. And the whole key to that, why do banks still work? Because all I got to do is have one password on a little key thing and access my account and trade a currency if I want to. Pietro, if I may, uh, that's a, a very uh, important uh, angle to look at this uh, uh, matter. I'd like to broaden a little bit the, the subject how states, how the public governance uh, considers all these games with cryptocurrencies. We hardly find a single state on the globe that would accept ever that cryptocurrency will be playing the role of uh, fiat money. Because in modern democracies and modern states, there are just two components that make the state to be the state is the right to print the money and the right to apply force legally. That's it. So when we're saying cryptocurrency in at the presence of a, of a bureaucrat or functionary, we are questioning it's the fundamental uh, elements of, of existence. And uh, in the modern practice, even in, in a very advanced legal system like the United States, Canada, Europe, cryptocurrencies are considered to be the assets. And when you consider to enter into cryptocurrencies operations, you have to consider, first of all, these taxation uh, uh, consequences. There's still a transaction that goes on. There's, Absolutely, yes. From but, a lower value to a higher value. Yes, but uh, that's exactly yeah. the, the point, that the taxation could be very different between the gain that you're getting from uh, exchanging the real estate for real estate or money for real estate and uh, entering into cryptocurrencies transaction. Well, eventually, you have to get out, you have to exit in order to actually... Within your ecosystem, and, and what we're trying to get to, I suppose, even with Bitcoin right now still, I saw the Kentucky Fried Chicken, but that's all for then a promo. I don't really see that as an endorsement. It's more like, look how cool we are, and you know, we're really young, and you know, we're Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's really bad for you, but we're really, really modern, and you know, we're really tech you know, you know, aware. Um, this universe of tokens, I, I mean, and I've got to do this whole password thing and, and, and whatnot, and yeah, I can, you know, trade this on my mobile phone, but I still, oh my God, I lost the book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh gosh, you know, I, I gave the wrong book to that criminal down the street. That was supposed to be my, my you know, you know, my, my, that was my records for how I took care of my car for the last year. <laughs> I had my passwords in it. I, it in this, man, this, this madness of thousands of tokens, who's, who's figuring out how and what and how you use that? I mean, in real life, I mean, reality, how does the average consumer try to figure out if I just, sometimes I just want a service and I'm really lazy and I don't want to know a whole lot of other things I can do. I just want that thing over with, and, you know, and get it done and go home, <laughs> all right? How, Hong, how, how does that happen in the future? Uh, how, does, how do we rationalize this between the millions of services and really smart, it's going to look like that prop deck thing up there. You know, you saw that. Look, that looks like an explosion, not an organization. Go ahead, please. I think uh, many of the people in this field might disagree or agree. And that is the, one of the most important questions that if anybody was in this uh, forum yesterday, they showed a chart about all the dApps currently used. And the number one dApp used has only about 3,500 uses per day. And that's the same problem the general public, although they know they heard about cryptocurrency, all the crazy hype, 
like uh, Bitcoin went to 20,000 and it dropped down to what, 6,000 now? Around that. And they just wanted to go in the high, all the volatility. But the consequences, there is just not many results to prove to the general public how important it can be and how it can affect the general public. So, like the question you said before, is it in the infancy? How can, yeah. Boy, there's a good one. Because the whole point of crypto, to some sense, is to democratize access. Mm -hmm. Am I right? But at the end of the day, it's only really smart people who know how to do that. And when you're talking about these property trans, uh, services and whatnot, okay, and the investors that go into it and say this is going to be massive, the professionals will take it, will we'll, we'll sign on. And they will earn tokens with each other and whatnot. And, and Mike, is that the idea that it's the professional who then makes that accessible to the consumer, really, as opposed to the consumer going directly. So isn't there a cost, a frictional cost, and not elimination of intermediaries, but maybe more efficient intermediaries? Definitely. Uh, so just, you know, Bitcoin was the first crypto asset and it spawned this new asset class called crypto assets with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and others and then other projects that aren't currencies that have their own tokens. And these things are traded and speculated upon and everything. And the people playing around with these right now, uh, there's a lot of problems like Pietro mentioned with personal asset management. You can lose your piece of paper or your hardware wallet or the keys to your, uh, your software wallet or you, anything. Just break in a second. You know the real irony, she, like this really brilliant young lady about technology, you know what she said? Whatever you do, don't put it on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> How about a feather pen and a piece of parchment? <laughs> yeah, so I think where we're going uh, from here, there's companies that are helping with personal asset management and organization uh, so to make it more usable for the average person to trade to manage their own collection of of crypto assets right now it's it's difficult some people believe that you know if you're in it now uh, you're gonna be part of the early few who uh, get to benefit from uh, the benefits of ease of use that'll come over the next couple of years, but it, it's difficult, it's risky right now uh, to manage these uh, crypto assets. Now, I don't want anybody in this room to get a sense that this is a critique of the cryptocurrency. It's, it's just a discussion of the reality of a condition at this moment in time. It is simply a problem to be solved with massive upside opportunity for whoever's smart enough to figure out how you make this simple. You know, I always believe in one philosophy in, well, maybe it's two, and if, probably if I had a beer, I'd speak for about three hours. But anyway, let's get boil it down to two. One is, you know, the KISS philosophy, approach to everything. That's the KISS principle. You know what that is? Keep it simple and stupid. And until we make it simple and stupid, it's going to be hard to do. And someone out here, because I know it's going to be a Korean, I just know it's going to be a Korean group, <laughs> figures this out. If we can honestly make that available and accessible and redundant to the average person, there is going to be a revolution in cryptocurrency. Right now, Bitcoin is still for those who either really just take a shot or are really, in, are really embedded into the industry. And they're trading it because they do see its vision, they understand it, and they can afford the time. And they probably got a bunch of smart people tracking and mining and doing all of that. But for the most part, the average human being is not walking around with wallets full of, of, of Bitcoin. But that's not a critique. That's the opportunity to solve that 
access problem, keeping it simple and stupid. How do we get there? How do we get from where we are? Where now, if we create a like dream chain, we create this universe of brilliant apps, each one with its own token universe, so that it's bounded, which we have to go through several exchanges to get to, which can be, it's got to be managed through an exchange, which in my mind sounds like centralization of some sort. Regardless, once you have a port or a point, a nexus where something goes from here to there and changes its characteristic, there's a fractional transaction that goes on. And someone's controlling that portal somehow. Do you, can anyone here has any sense of how, in, as you create these wonderful concepts that could have their own total user universe and never go outside of it, in fact, right? The people who need that service and use it constantly will always be there and you create a very specialized user community that bleeds out to the consumer through greater efficiency. Is that right? Go ahead. Talking about usability, and you mentioned pocket and whether you keep this technology in the pocket. Uh, I, just, I lose my jackets when I walk around. Exactly. Salt. I just want to I interact. lose my wallet in every taxi I ever saw. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the only thing in Korea is sometimes a taxi driver actually sends my wallet back. <laughs> I just want to ask the audience, um, and this is, uh, you know, just to confirm that blockchain and cryptocurrency is not just a trend. We're not sitting in this stage just for this and next year or the other. Um, ask yourself this question. Um, how many of you have smartphones? Uh, you don't have to answer. But now... Nobody, nobody ever raises their hand, I know that. No, yeah. You gotta look for the face. But now, <laughs> go a generation back and ask yourself the same question, and this is the one you have to answer. How many of your parents already have a smartphone in their pocket? And ask yourself the question, why do they have it in their pocket? Because they're using it. So hence, the blockchain and the cryptocurrency is not a trend. It's a necessity that eventually is going to get into the pockets even of your parents, maybe even in your grandparents. And, and this is going to be in less than five years. It's, it's just a matter of how much you, you use it on a daily basis in your lives. It's going to come to your pocket. It's going to come to your smartphone. It's going to come to, to uh, every single transaction you do in, in, in your day. OK, so let's try to summarize. OK. We all can understand that after all, this, is a real, this was like a real estate forum, so I'm just going to be very focused on that. But it's applicable across all spectrums. The industry's revolution is still a bunch of revolutionaries planning a revolution. It's the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> all right. Okay. Maybe even that was more advanced in some ways. There are huge movements and I've seen capital starting to move and say, this is where the next big game really is, is solving problems relating to creating a, that block efficiencies that, that diminish transparencies and sometimes create corruptibilities. And the opportunity today is you're, none of you in this room are behind the eight ball. You're all where you should be right now. But you should be planning to ask yourself if this is truly the next wave of unlocking some portion of that 217 trillion, getting out of the hands of that 1%, and making borders disappear to some level that's still compliant so that so when you go and build your chain, you build your business, you suddenly don't find it cratered because the government regulation just changed. 
I think we all agree government regulatory bodies are not really interested in impeding a technology. They're trying to figure out how they adapt to it before they endorse it. And they all know, I mean, I meet with government people all the time, and the first thing out of their mouth is blockchain. And Cheju has just announced not only will it integrate its entire economy around blockchain, but it's going to issue a Cheju coin. Now, you know, that sounds like an octopus card in Hong Kong, right? You get all kinds of, isn't that just kind of another crypto? I could, like, sell my octopus to somebody because <laughs> I got all of these bonuses and all of this stuff um, that went along with it. And I can now sell my Hong Kong octopus for a bit more money because it actually has this accrued benefits through its use. Hmm? But as I say, I... Application to real estate is not a wish or a dream, it's an absolute necess a necessity. Blockchain, I think, is not necessarily linked in, in terms of creating the efficiencies to cryptocurrencies, except in that application that somehow the token creates greater efficiencies in that technology or in the cooperation of blockchain. So, I want to... You know, we have a minute. Does anyone have anything else left to say? Any any other point you want to make? Well, go ahead. If I may, uh, I think that's where the, the government should be the part of the pro, pro, process, uh, should stimulate uh, what we should be grateful for, the example of the American, American startup culture. The slogan, fail fast, fail cheap, this tolerance for failure that is to say that I have, I have to have the right for a mistake, but coming back to the statement that the basis of all cryptocurrencies and the blockchains, all these decentralized solutions will be the trust of particular people. And the trust comprises the right for the failure and then to support to each other. So okay. let's remain the human beings in this virtual environment. And that's the philosophy of a professor. Thank you. No. We need, that's what we need. Um, I want to thank everybody for patience. I hope it was of some value in terms of insight. I try to talk about realities, not just visions and dreams. Um, I try to be not critical. I try to take a critical approach to understanding the magnitude of an opportunity. And I hope that with these experts, people who are doing it, every single one here is you out there. So thank you very much, and thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you.